So we have a, a special speaker now, special in many ways. And for me, it's really important to have these spiritually strong souls in our lives, someone that we can raise our own personal bar to, to I hope that's what your take home is today and how I can improve my meditative practice so that I can better um, heal myself and work for, strive for a vibrant, healthy life in so many ways. And so Dr. Hansa Raval has been a meditation teacher and practitioner for almost 50 years, <laughs> a lot of a wealth of experience, and has served in, at, in many ways and in many capacities. And so she's also serving in the US, or retired now, but she was a colonel in the US Army <laughs> and served in the oncology. She was head of oncology in the US Army Hospital. So I'd like to welcome our, oh, she, of course, she, she got a call as we set the stage. But, so I'll take this time then to just set the next um, item. And with Dr. Hansa, um, actually, I think we should put her front and center uh, because we won't need the screen, really. I could read out. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't think we need the screen for the rest of let this be front and center so we can really appreciate this time with her and with all of you in in zoom world <laughs> and um i'll just maybe i could read the bio for you but i did uh share with you um already what's on that slide because she does a lot of work for women and children um she heads a lot of different um, organizations. She's been a scientist with the World Health Organization. She's worked on studies. She, uh, so many things. She, she can't sit idle, let's put it that way. She's always researching and investigating. And nothing better than our own personal lives. You know, what's real? How can I be more of who I am um, and be a serviceable presence? in the world, but it sounds lofty in the world, but when we are in resonance, doesn't it affect the world? Doesn't it? Not only our own communities and, and family. So after that, we'll have a chance to meditate together with um, Dr. Hansa, and we have um, Brother Mark, who's also from Texas, Houston, Texas, visiting us. He's been uh, teaching and practicing Raj Yoga meditation for 33 years. And so he will guide us with a commentary, and we will also have the harp. So wonderful way to close our time together here in the hall. And afterwards, we'll go upstairs and enjoy a wonderful uh, meal together. And you can also look at the exhibits that are up there you've enjoyed them on your break but ha get you know and there's some lovely little take homes some little um, items and also get more information from the presenters they will be up there at their tables okay and here she is <laughs> so please welcome our dear Hansa Didi as we fondly call her greetings of peace I'm very happy to be with you and I would like to share my experiences in the you know, power of healing. Everyone who is in health profession, especially taking care of the sick ones, they have been instrument, chosen to be instrument to bring the vibrations of healing and 
and also they have got empathy and they have accumulated a lot of blessings from you know the work they are doing for patients or whoever needs help. So I believe that the blessings we earn by taking care of anyone who is sick, whether it is at home or it is at the hospital, that empathy, that kindness goes long, long way in healing. Most of the time when we hear about somebody being very sick or seriously ill or terminally ill, if somebody we know, then the reaction is uh, very emotional. There is a lot of feeling of mercy, feeling of, uh, you know, kindness, feeling fear of unknown. So there are mixed feelings. But all the work which has been done in healing, healing serious illnesses, it is said that if you come across somebody whom you know very well, you are close to and you get the news that they have got a terminal illness or major illness, then our feeling should be of strength, giving that soul the strength, because that person has already heard about the news, and the, the person is suffering two reasons. One, because of the illness, and because knowing how serious the illness is. Uh, but what we do is opposite. We start self-pity, and we start consoling, we try to be, you know, extremely over-helpful. The way we do is, it creates more pain for the person who is suffering. So the best way to do is, it is very difficult, but anybody can be trained. We can learn to do anything. So what I do, or what I'm trained to do, is Whenever I see that someone whom I love or one of the person whom I don't know, when I find out serious diagnosis, I go into deep silence, in internal solitude, and I give them beautiful, positive thoughts that you are going through this crisis, but my feelings and my good wishes and my uh, uh, good words and thoughts is going to start the healing process. I don't think of this medicine because of, I'm a doctor that I'm going to give this and I'm going to do this. First, I want to make sure that the person who is sick gets some benefit from my empathy, the silence, the pure feelings I have for them that they will definitely get better. And I want to make the difference. And that is very easy to do. Instead of being emotional and being fearful, what is going to happen, what is not going to be predictable or predictable, we don't know. Whatever thoughts I create, the person who is sick and the person whom I love, they will instantly catch it. And it will definitely make them worse. Because we have a habit that if somebody is sick, we over-baby them. We try to be kind to them, we give them certain consideration, we try to do their work, we try to do, you know, we try to be over, like you baby somebody who is sick. It is going to make the sickness worse. Hundred percent. So first thing, this research was done. Uh, I'll tell you my one example. There was a patient who was about 50 years old, terminal, cancer patient. Chemotherapy was used, radiation was used. He went through vigorous treatment in a big medical center, but nothing worked. 
he became emaciated and like a skeleton and happened to be my patient. Nothing would work. So we took him to Simonton Institute, which was in Dallas. They do different type of healing and treatment. So I went with him to, because I wanted to see and learn. The doctor saw him and the doctor said that, oh, you are here, no? So he was not kind and sympathetic. He says, you know what is my goal? Doctor said, my goal is to you to run out from here. And we are going to achieve this goal, but you have to help me. So the patient is looking at me with his eyes that, you know, I'm going to run. So he says, from now on, you have to do exercise daily. So again, this patient is looking at me, you know, what exercise I'm going to do? I'm brought in a stretcher. What I'm going to do is start wiggling your toes and fingers. Just start from now on. Don't just lie down and be pitiful. And he says, I don't want no relatives to see you till I train the relatives. Because the self-pity, babying, kills. Because we over, our emotions, we want to do something, but we do wrong thing. Instead of giving strength, we don't realize, but we make the person weak. So like, you know, we saw the exercise, music. Exercise is very important for a sick person. But what do we do when somebody gets sick? We want them to rest. We want them to hold their hand. We want to give them wheelchair. We, we, we want to help them in our own way. But I saw this doctor, he was looked a little bit, you know, strict, that you have to run there. I'm not going to run. So we start it now. He's not even talking about illness. He, he knew that this is a failed cancer patient. The treatment has failed. And then he said, what diet you are taking? Uh, so he was asked to be on a vegetarian diet. He says, from now, no more protein, no milk products. You are going to eat what we give you. Do you agree? Do you? So first exercise is agreed that I can wiggle my fingers and toes. And he says, the food you will get is going to be vegetarian. I don't want any relatives to come and see you till I train them. Because I want your relatives to help you heal. And then he says, you have to also work to heal yourself. I'm going to be your assistant, and you are going to be the doctor who is going to heal yourself. So I was surprised. Then he said that what you, I'm going to teach you meditation. And no relative is going to see you till I teach them meditation. And so meditation was very simple. Only thing the patient had to do was think positive. That this, I am the one who can heal. My body is sick. It is my body. It's like when my car is broken, we dump it into the garage and let them fix it. But he says, this is not... This is your body. This is not your car. You have to fix yourself. Nobody is going to fix it. So he was very happy. I could see expression changes on his face that I can do something for my healing because the cancer is in my body and I have to do something to help my body heal. So he started meditation process. He says, think imaginary that there is a shark and your cancer is little fish and shark is going here, going here, going to the cancer and what does shark do to a fish? It says even if there's a big number of fish, shark will swallow it. Positive, positive, any way you want to. Means you have to be creative, keep busy, 
Okay, if you don't like the example of shark, then find something else which is more powerful. The lion is going in, and this one is a little, you know, lamb. And the idea is to think positive that I am going to destroy my own cancer by positive thinking. And not just throughout the day, don't sit there. Give them a big book, colors, pen, paint, whatever you want to do. And says, paint, I told you now, start drawing. And from the drawing, we could know that if the person is weak or strong. From the drawing, he was a psychologist, oncologist, and his wife was a psychiatrist. And oncologist. So she will know from the psych picture, the patient draws, whatever he can draw, whether what type of weakness is in the soul that is still, you know, overcome by the diagnosis of cancer and has given up hope to live. That's what we want to find out, whether there is a hope to live or the, the patient has given up hope that I don't want to, I, I won't make it. It is advanced too much. You look at my situation. And then accordingly give them strong suggestions. And every day they have to draw pictures and meditate, positive meditation, loud. Reinforcement, positive. That, you know, I'm very powerful. I have power to heal. And I'm, even though people think I'm a hopeless, I've been sent away from the hospital to, uh, that we can't do anything. I'm going to make sure that I make it. So that type of meditation, positive thinking. And then when, then after a few days of this exercise, they get all the relatives, the close ones. They get the same training. When you come to see, you're not going to see and self-pity. When you come, you sit there and give them the bright, bright rays, like radiation, bright white light rays going inside their body and they show the relatives where the cancer is and how does it look and he says you send this rays with your mind and the rays are going to the place where there is cancer and it is destroying the rays are destroying the cancer and he says this is the way normal looks and this is what the patient has they're your relatives you have to imagine and throw this rays from this to this. And you have to also think that I'm not going to self-pity, I'm going to participate in my loved one's healing instead of feeling self-pity or babying the patient and worry about it, that what's going to happen. So I have to be positive as a relative. So they have been given training. I don't want to go into detail because we don't have much time. But Every, whoever the relative is, they have to be made strong first because they also are equally as weak as the cancer patient because there is a worry, there is anxiety. None of us want to see the lov loved ones you know, go through suffering. So that feeling when your loved one is going to suffering, that feeling can make it worse. So. This is opposite. He says, come wear bright clothes, you know, be cheerful, bring something for the, him to be cheerful with the patient and start thinking. At home, when you go to sleep, you meditate. So relatives, loved ones meditate, the patient is meditate, and entire staff, even the sweeper, the one who cleans the hospital and the rooms, they are all meditating when they are there, that this patient, my pure wishes, I'm sending him powerful rays. This patient is going to run away from the hospital. Even the sweeper, nurses, doctors, social worker, nutritionist, everybody over there was trained with this form of meditation. Positive thinking. When the doctor is giving chemotherapy, Doctor is very silent, he's meditating. He's not giving chemotherapy. He's giving healing medita medi medicine, healing liquid, nectar, which is going to go 
in this patient's body and the patient is going to be healing. And he knows that the cancer. And the patient is thinking same. He says, when I'm giving you chemotherapy or radiation, you don't think of radiation. White, white, strong rays are going to my cancer and destroying it. And I will think same. If the relative wants to sit there, they also think positive, positive, positive. Not only positive, but we are power of mind. We are destroying the cancer. And then diet, everyday exercise. As stronger you get, stronger exercise. Start with wiggling toes. And this continues. After six weeks, they are on their own. Then the chemotherapy and radiation start. It is not that it is on. This is complementary. This self-healing and relatives participation is complementary. Again, same chemotherapy, same radiation, according to what type of cancer they have. You will be surprised. The medicine, they were resistant to, it was not working, started working. The cancer destroyed 69.2% terminal patient ran away from the hospital. It is unbelievable. I couldn't believe. So one day after about one year or so or six months, somebody told my secretary I have an appointment. So he says, what's your name? He says, I don't see your name, you know. He says, I have an appointment. I have seen her before. So I heard something outside with the secretary, and uh, I told the secretary, let him in, you know, because the secretary was stopping him that you don't have an appointment, we have another patient. So he walked in. He didn't even listen to secretary. He came and says, I've come to see you, I have an appointment. I said, I don't uh, recall that you have an appointment. Uh, what is your name? He says, you know my name. I said, maybe I have forgotten your name. He says, you don't recognize me? I said, do you recognize me? That's enough. <laughs> I said, you recognize me? That is enough. You tell me. He says, I'm your, that patient you took. You know, she was about six feet. He had put on about 50 pounds, 60 pounds, and very jolly. I never saw him jolly. Very funny. And he was, you know, behaving so funny. He said, look, what difference has happened. I was so happy to see the result. But this is not only one case. I'm just giving you the example <coughs> of many, many terminal cases. And I want to tell you one thing, that there was a patient uh, who had a breast cancer. And... She went through this therapy and got healed completely. Chemotherapy, radiation, wiped out her cancer. And then she came back after five years, six years. So the doctor says, why are you here? I'm not going to do anything for you. I treated you. You treated yourself. You were cured. Go and cure yourself. And then the doctor knew that she has come because something has happened and she wants to heal again. The most important thing I'm telling you about any sickness, this is proven, that for cancer patient, heart patient, stroke patient, terminal cases, means catastrophic illness. Six months to eight months before, there is some traumatic experience. Now, something can happen. It might not be traumatic for me. You know, I'll just write it off and say, who cares? But for some, even petty things happen, and it becomes very traumatic, you know, emotional, and they feel that they cannot talk to anybody, nobody can do anything. They are just uh, upset and angry with themselves and angry with who, whoever. 
in this suppress. The suppressing, suppressing, suppressing their emotions and creating very negative emotions for themselves. In the institution which I was in Dallas, there were 78% with emotional trauma like this, every cancer patient. So when I started my work, in my cases, I was very sweet and loveful and gradually, because they don't want to tell doctor about their problem. They want to keep it private. So everybody doesn't come out with deep emotional problem. But, you know, very sweetly I talk, they tell me, yes, this happened and this happened. It was 98%. The others, because there was male doctor and, you know, little strong, so they were not able to tell. And you would not believe. I know many people whom I'm very close to in Brahma Kumaris, and they had cancer. And I told them that, you know, I'm doing some research. Will you please tell me, did you have any issue which created, you know, 100% yes. So we should not take it for granted that whatever emotions and feelings, traumatic feelings, you know, relationship issue we go through or issue of, uh, you know, bankruptcy, issue of, uh, you know, money, severe money loss. I've seen many, many people lose all the money in stock market. The people I know very well, they lost all the money in stock market when stock market crashed in the 80s. Many people were in the hospital with severe heart attacks. Many, within three months, developed cancer. Some had stroke. So we should take our thoughts, emotions, and feelings very seriously because it will create illness. And Somebody might not understand it, and I can, you know, not receive proper treatment. And even if I receive treatment when I'm in that mood of being, you know, emotionally suppressed and upset, no medicine will work. <laughs> like Simon did, what he did, he first created an environment, emotional environment, positive environment, relatives, and he asked me, the relatives who bother you cannot enter this institution. We have to check who can come and see you. People don't want to walk in with self-pity. Oh, he's sick, let me go and see. No. They had to be go to the secretary interrogation before they, they have to be trained before they can see their own relative. Otherwise, not allowed. He says, forget about them. Let's get you well, then you can go. So, what I'm trying to say that this should be our natural life. So if we get sick, we should be able to help ourselves heal. Another way it can be done is, for example, some patient come and they are not able to go through all this. You know, they're already traumatic in an environment of trauma of the body is sick family is very emotional and crying and uh, worrying about death or what's going to happen. So what helps, which I have done for every patient, I have cancer patient, I don't tell them, I said, we'll send positive vibration. I tell them to be vegetarian. I tell them to do exercises. I tell them to be, but I am the one who get up one hour early early morning when it is very peaceful and I send them powerful vibrations of healing. I don't use, you know, this light energy. I use the power of the supreme light, the power with the supreme soul, we call him, you know, the light, the healing light. I use the I take the power from the supreme being and I speak to the Supreme Being about the patient, where the cancer is, and I send them the powerful vibration directly from Supreme Being, me to that patient. And give them healing process, send them pure words, it doesn't matter. We all have to live our body one way. But my goal is, 
not that 100% of the patient will survive. No. There are going to be patients who will not survive. But the goal is that 100% of my patients and Dr. Simonton's patients, the goal is they die with dignity. They die with peace. Their family will also let them go with peace, with final conclusion that now this soul cannot be in this body anymore. It has to live, so we will make it beautiful. And you would not believe how much when the time of death comes, how much responsive we are to any help. One day, when I was in active duty military, the door bang rang, and I opened the door, and there were two ladies. One lady was helping another lady, so I knew she was sick. And as soon as I opened the door, very bad smell was coming in the breathing, like pus, like put, and I, I knew immediately this patient has this person has problem in the lung. I thought it could be severe pneumonia or something, septicemia. The smell of the pus is very strong odor. So I said, uh, are you at the right place? Are you supposed to be here? I didn't know what was happening. He says, we came to see you. I said, she's very sick. You should be in the hospital. Because I didn't, she looked very, very terminal. So I said, you should take her to the hospital. He says, no, I took her out from the hospital. And I want her to see you. So I said, OK. So we brought her in, set her in the living room. So she's completely not interested. The patient was not interested and was not looking at me. And I knew she was very depressed. But the sister, he says, this is my sister, my only sister, only relative on earth. And she's dying. And I want you to help her. And I immediately realized that I need to help both of them. You know, I immediately realized that if she goes, this one is going to be fall apart. So I said, OK. So this one will not look at me. She was not interested. She was only wanting to go, but didn't know how to. So I started talking to your sister. I said, you know, your sister? I know she had lung cancer, is it true? He said, yes, she has lung cancer, she had treatment, and she didn't survive. I said, wait, you know, your sister, she doesn't have cancer. Her body has cancer. But, you know, when the soul, I touched her, I said, till the soul is inside, she is alive. But, the soul is not suffering from cancer. Soul is only suffering from the pain. But soul doesn't have cancer. And I said, I know you are going through pain, but you know what happens? I, if you're interested, I can tell you when the time comes closer for us to leave the body. So immediately she looked at me. I knew that now my work is done. Whatever I say, she is going to accept. I was talking to the sister because I wanted to prepare her for her sister leaving the body. So I say, do you know, when we are born, our mother is always there to receive. It can never happen that mother gives birth and you know the child is being received. I said, there's always a nurse or a doctor. So there are at least minimum two people, or sometimes only mother. But the baby is received. This is a physical birth. And when we are ready to leave the body, there is the, the soul is not visible. So many doctors are here. When the soul leaves the body, we don't even know. We know the difference between a live body and a dead body. But we cannot do anything in between. If a doctor could catch hold of the soul and put it in a, in a box, uh, then we can heal the body and put the soul back. But this is impossible. So 
I was explaining to other, I said, so when we are ready to leave the body, there is another mother, the Supreme Mother, who is always in advance waiting to receive you because their mother knows that I'm going to deliver a baby. It's time to, you know, deliver. All mothers know. I said, so this Supreme Mother will be waiting, waits for us. And as soon as I leave, gets me in the lab and is so happy and joyful and gives me so much love and happiness, like, you know, perfect child and a perfect mother. Like love and happiness and joy. There'll be, that is the feeling when we leave the body. But we, if we don't know about the, what happens when we are going to leave the body, are we going to go with same cancer, same pain, same emotion? I said, no. As soon as the soul leaves the body, finished. Everything finishes. You won't believe even you forget the body. And I have so many patients, some very close friends who have left the body. And my last meeting with them is the most loving, most enlightening. So much love coming from the soul. And you feel that, you know, this person is not able to drink, eat, nothing is emaciated, but the feelings are so good. So this patient, I said, so I hold her hand and I said, don't worry. Death does not mean end. You are going to have a beautiful life and you are going to meet our creator, the creator of the soul. So don't worry, you'll have a beautiful experience and your sister is going to be okay. We'll take care of her. So I send them. I was with them for 10 or 15 minutes because I was afraid that if she leaves the body <laughs> there, that there will be a lot of complications for me. So I wanted to, you know, send her away as soon as possible. So she went. At about, this was about 7.38 in the evening. At midnight, I get a phone call. And, you know, I'm on call, so I immediately picked up the phone. So she says, I am, you know, Judy. So I said, oh, how is your sister? Judy, are you all right? So she said, uh, you know, my sister, I want, ask me to call you. Uh, so I said, uh, is she okay? He says, no. He says, I took her to the hospital. I was sitting next to her. She hold my hand and told me, he says, look, that doctor was telling my mother is standing in the corner. He says, what does the mother look like? He says, bright, bright light. He's telling me, come, baby, I'm waiting for you. I'm very eager to have you. He says, he's calling me. He says, I want to go. Is it okay if I go? She was, she was asking permission from her sister. Is it okay if I go? He says, go. He's, he's waiting for you. So he says, she, was, she said, tell the doctor that I will meet her again. And he says, tell her I am all right. And he says, very peacefully, looking at me, she left. He says, we have a few minutes conversation, and she was gone. And this was, you know, sudden. I didn't have planned to prepare or do nothing. I was just waiting to make sure that she doesn't leave the body where I was because it'll be difficult for me to handle the situation. But many, many, it has happened. Recently, but last month, there was a person who had mouth cancer. He got chemotherapy. He, he learned meditation, changed his diet. Everything was changed. And he was very regular meditation, everything. He had a cancer in the mouth, and they gave him chemotherapy, gave, gave him radiation, very strong. The cancer disappeared. And then we were so happy, we were celebrating, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, he got COVID in the hospital, and a very strong uh, dose of COVID. So he was very, very sick. And they called me, so I, they said, doctor says we will not allow you to come and see him because we are, we are, he's immunocompromised and he has COVID. 
and he might not make it. So I said, he will make it. So I told him, I said, look, you conquered cancer. You can conquer KB. Don't say anything to the doctor. Just be strong. And I, you know, you're going to be all I says, yes, Didi, I'm going to be very strong. I'm not giving up. You know, they have given up, but I'm not giving up. So I was happy that he's taking care of himself. His wife was very strong also because she meditates and she knows. And then, the, because of COVID, the water accumulated around his uh, heart. And they found a lump, tumor, outside his heart. So doctor all told him that you got a few days to live. And you cannot, there was nothing we can do and send him to, you know, home. So same day they were going to send home, he called me. He called me, means he told his brother that I want to talk. And he says, Didi, you know, doctors are saying that uh, I'm not going to make it, that I've got only a few hours or a few days left, but I'm still not giving up. So I said, don't give up. And then uh, I said I should go. Uh, I got whoever was with me, I told them, let's go and meditate for him. So I sat in meditation, and I was sending him powerful, powerful vibrations of being with the Supreme Being and, you know, being very blissful and happy and everything. And so I, was, I meditated for half an hour. And his brother called again after, you know, half an hour. I was in meditation, called me. He said, this Jitin Bhai said that she had such a, she has having such a beautiful experience. This is funny. He, few minutes back, he told me he's going to make it. He's not going to leave. He's going to fight it. I said, okay, my work is done. Then after about 45 minutes, he's telling his brother, when we were me, Mark Bhai, other sisters, I told them all of, Lord, Lord, let us meditate and send him beautiful vibration so he gets strength. He got so much strength, he, he, saw, he had a feeling of being with the Supreme Being and so much beautiful experience. He told his brother, call Didi, I'm leaving. <laughs> he says, told Didi, goodbye. She's telling... I'm saying, please tell Didi goodbye. I'm having such a beautiful experience. I don't want to suffer here in this world. I'm going. And he died. He left the body. I couldn't believe it. If within a few minutes, one hour, the news came, he's gone. So what I'm trying to say is we can heal ourselves. It is tough. <laughs> It is difficult because there is severe emotional crisis, fear, all the things are going on, but we have to find a safe passage, which is within us. And if every patient I see, I teach the meditation, I don't need artificial healing light or rays. I use the power and the light of the Supreme Being. He's the healer and he's our, you know, we in, in, in uh, Hindus believe that the Supreme Being is not only my father, but he's my mother and he's my friend. God is my mother, he's my father, he's my best friend. And only thing I need to do be in touch with it and know a little bit introduction. So this is, if we can do it, I'm not saying that every patient will survive. Because we are not going to survive all the time in this body. We all have to leave body. But my wish for my body is when I leave the body, I want to be joyful, blissful, happy, and live in such a way that all the ones who love me, who are around me, they, don't, they are also happy and peaceful and bid me farewell. Another case. 18 year, 16 year old boy has a sarcoma of the leg. Sarcoma is spread from his hip to knee. So they immediately found me and 
the boy was strong, but the parents were falling apart. The only son, and 18, 16 years old. So I took him to the New York, because in New York, they don't cut off legs. They remove the cancer. In Texas, they cut off the leg to save the patient from cancer spreading. So we flew all the way to New York, and he had a, a 12-hour surgery. Four surgeons, they removed all the cancer completely. But then he had to take chemotherapy, radiation. So he took lots of... He went on vacation. I told him, just enjoy. Parents were millionaires. I said, go and enjoy. Enjoy the life. I taught him meditation. He became vegetarian, everything. He will go on vacation, get well, then come back with cancer. Then he had again chemotherapy, radiation, again get well. The, patient, the doctor had given him six months to live. He lived for 12 years, and not sorry 12 years, happy 12 years. Yeah, he went to chemotherapy. He just said, uh, he called me auntie. He says, tell auntie I'm in the hospital so she can meditate for me. I said, OK, I will meditate. He will send a message. They tell auntie I'm in the hospital, I'm going to lie down and enjoy, and she can meditate for me. I said, OK, I'll meditate for you. So this ha happened. So one day, it was uh, before Valentine. He decided he doesn't want to take any chemotherapy and radiation, and he has to leave. And I want auntie to be here. I had to travel 600 miles to get where he was, because I was far away. I, they told me he wants to have a consultation with me before dying. Imagine, I couldn't believe. So I went there, he says, Auntie, you know, I want to die, but I'm afraid how the death is going to be. I said, death is going to be better than birth. When you came out, you were crying. And you were red, red, and you were covered with... He says, the day, birth was not pleasant. I said, you know, uh, it was not pleasant. Ask your mom. But <laughs> I said, but when you die, you are going to go as a prince. He says, you are going to be received by a beautiful, loving, caring feelings, caring vibrations. And they're going to embrace you, you immediately forget me, your mommy, your papa, everybody. You will just become selfish and run away because you are in so much joy and bliss. He said, really? I'm going to be free from these thoughts of cancer and how am I going to make it or not? I said, yes. So he says, when shall I go? So I said, anytime you want to. So, but he says, I'm not going because my when we were having conversation, I made her mother sit there, so she is healing too. I made her sister sit there. Father was crying in different room, so he says, "I'm not going because my father is going to fall apart, only son." So I said, "We'll take care of it. You take care of yourself. Your mommy is strong like a rock. Your sister is okay. We'll take care of your father." Then he says, "Okay." Then he says, so I said, whenever you want to go, just go. So he calls me when I, he says, can I stay before it was Valentine and there was a Super Bowl? Super Bowl. <laughs> he was a Super Bowl. This guy is dying. This is, he's only, he's now 29 because, you know, he was 16. And uh, he says, is it okay if I uh, stay here for Super Bowl? He said, talk to your papa or mommy. Up above, if they give you permission, you can stay till Super Bowl game. You can see the Super Bowl game and then go. So then he says, okay, then I'm going to make arrangements so I can leave. The mother was so, became so strong, she realized this game is going on between this one and him leaving the body. Mother figured out that, you know, he's ready. You won't believe... After Super Bowl, he called all his parents, mother, father, and sister. He came and he, said, well, he told, Father, give me your hand. Bid farewell to me. He says, I'm going. And he says, 
how do you see I look? What do you think? He says, very peaceful and happy. He says, remember me as this. He told his father, I am already very, very peaceful, at very calm and very comfortable. I'm ready to go. And he says, within two minutes, he left the body. And this, uh, these people are very close to me. I know them for 20 years. And I knew the boy. So what I'm trying to say that there are, this is for any illness you have. Sometimes we self-pity ourselves and we want to be sick. The doctors, no, I want to be sick. So I get special attention. I get special treatment. I get special, you know, thing. But, and sometimes I don't know what to do. The, the, there's so many tension is going, worry, anxiety is going on. So it is not possible for me to let go of the illness. <laughs> I'm not talking about letting go of the, you know, body, but we don't want to let go of the illness. It becomes a chronic problem and it goes on and on forever. And so many people have files in the hospital like this that they call, you know, malingering or whatever they are doing, but their focus is to get attention. So all these are problems which are not in the body. Body is a depot. But the problem is in, starts in the mind, intellect, uh, feelings, sentiments, relationship, whatever. So we need to find a way where we can heal ourselves. And if you are in that situation, I recommend don't baby. They will feel that you are neglecting them. You might feel that you are ignoring them, but you are not. You are making them, even if I'm sick, I have to live on, you know, with my body. I cannot dump my body on somebody else to take care of. I have to still live with the illness I have, whether it's a chronic illness or it is serious illness. I have to take some responsibility of my life. I cannot dump it on my relatives or loved ones. And if I, if somebody can create these uh, feelings that, you know, it is not right, the person who is sick will take guarantee, will take the responsibility. And I tell all who do us around me that if I get sick, don't pity me. If I die, just have a party. In India, if somebody dies after the age of 75, you know what they do? There is a huge celebration and there are bands and, you know, dancing and everything for every, everyone who dies after the age of 75 or 80. Celebration. So instead of pitying and somebody lived to be 75, 80, it is good news, you know. Others are still struggling. So there is nothing to cry. So we have to change our thinking. You will hear about many people, cancer, heart attack, stroke, this, arthritis, same. Arthritis can be healed very fast with emotional healing. Many, many illness. Music therapy is also one of the best for healing. All these natural things, exercise. Even if I'm sick, I don't miss my exercise. That's why my body is fit. I'm 83. And my body is fit. Why? Because I know that exercise creates endorphins and that makes me perky. That makes me, you know, give me a lot of enthusiasm. And I want to do things. But if I'm lazy and if I don't exercise, I become sluggish. I don't want to do things. I postpone things. I do this. So these are very important things which we need to learn, which hospital cannot teach us, doctors cannot teach us. Uh, uh, this is the art of living. And with art of living, there is an art of healing. Thank you. <laughs>